Welcome Whale Fest enthusiasts to the Art and Science of Whale Song. I'm Mary Alice Cerrito Fettis, Chair of Whale Fest Monterey. Whale Fest celebrates the biodiversity of the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary and the marine nonprofits, businesses, agencies, and institutions that affect it. Our event provides learning experiences for people of all ages and all levels of education. Whale Fest will be virtual this year, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. Join Dr. John Ryan of the Monterey Bay Research Institute and Nicholas Fettis, Whale Fest Music Director, for a deep dive into the musical world of whales as we explore new scientific findings about whale songs and compose on piano and cello together with these massive musical beings. Take it away. Hello, everybody. I'm Nicholas Fettis, and I'm going to open up with the Whale Fest theme song. This one's without whales, whale sounds accompanying it, but inspired by them. Just their movements, they're magnificent uh, creatures. And I'm going to play this tune Whales, Whales, O Majesty.
the first time I performed with a spectrograph, all of like Fantasia, the 1940 Fantasia. I hope you enjoyed it. And here is the one and only Dr. John Ryan. Thank you, Mary Alice. Thank you, Nicholas. And uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us for this exploration of whale song, the art and the science. And through art, Nicholas beautifully also introduced some of the science that we're going to explore tonight. The spectrogram that you've been watching respond to the piano shows you one of the ways that we analyze whale song, where time is moving along the horizontal and pitch or frequency is represented in the vertical. So I'm just going to temporarily stop this and move into some of the uh, scientific material that we've learned from studying whales right here in Monterey Bay. Okay, well, it really is tremendous to live here along the Central California coast, and one of the most amazing parts of living here is having this National Marine Sanctuary right offshore. And all of the sound recordings from the ocean that we're going to hear tonight are from the same location. Some old technology here. That location is right here, uh, right in the center of the sanctuary. And this black dot is the location of this cabled observatory which is connected to shore by copper and fiber optics that carry power and communications from scientists working on shore right to the deep sea. And this Mars Observatory stands for Monterey Accelerated Research System. At any given time, it may be hosting many science experiments. And one of those science experiments is simply listening, recording and analyzing sound from the ocean. And here, right here is a picture of the hydrophone sitting atop a one meter tripod. And there's the extension cord that plugs it into the main node and carries it back to shore for us. And Mars is sitting on a geological feature known as Smooth Ridge on the continental slope, just off the continental shelf here, adjacent to Monterey Submarine Canyon. So it's really, if I was a hyd hydrophone, I'd want to listen here. It's a beautiful setting. And in thinking about whale song, it's useful perhaps to start with human song. We're used to looking at how we represent uh, music on a sheet with time and timing along the horizontal and pitch or frequency along the vertical. Um, this song by Howard and Alan, this is where I learned that the fish on the land ain't happy. And now translating that very same idea into, in a sense, a sheet of music written by whales. Similarly, along the horizontal, we have time and timing. Along the vertical, we have pitch or frequency. And this is a logarithmic scale. So we're going from 10 to 100 to 1,000 hertz or cycles per second. And this purple background means that there isn't a strong sound being recorded by the hydrophone. Wherever you see bright colors, splashes of color, uh, those are uh, strong levels of sound, high levels of sound produced by three baleen whale species that inhabit our sanctuary and rely on it. In fact, the humpback whale, fin whale, and blue whale, all baleen whales, so they filter food out of the water with their baleen. And um, let's start perhaps at the top of the scale Humpbacks can s sing over a tremendous range of frequencies. So imagine you were at the opera and the bass singer was filling the theater with wonderful low frequency sound. And then you heard the soprano. You heard the soprano, but you couldn't see the soprano. So you, you searched the stage and you thought, well, maybe the soprano is entering in the back and getting some interaction with the audience. 
but you don't see the soprano anywhere. And then you notice that the bass singer, uh, the lips of the bass singer are moving in perfect synchrony with the voice of the soprano. And that's kind of what a humpback whale can do. It's a, it's a one whale uh, opera. <laughs> they can span eight octaves, more than eight octaves, one animal. So it's so pretty incredible. And this one, we're looking at just the lower end of this humpback whale song. And what I want you to notice is just the incredible structure. So this humpback whale song begins here, ends right about here. You can see it starts at the high frequency range, drops down, changes to a, a new theme, a, a third theme, fourth theme, fifth theme, and a sixth theme. And I'll describe what a theme in it is in just a moment. But you can see this beginning repeated right here as it um, again sings the same song with some degree of variation, improvisation. And the other reason I emphasize here that these are songs with variations on a theme is that humpback whales, they learn song from each other. A population, for example, in the Northeast Pacific will share their song. They all sing the same song, but they're, it's continuously evolving as they learn and as they hear from each other. And uh, <coughs> so in that sense, they are making variations on their own theme continuously. And one of the things we study is not just when song occurs, but how that song changes in time, because it is, in fact, part of their culture, part of their cultural transmission. So the humpback whales are all up here between roughly 80 hertz and, and 1,000 is what I'm showing. Now let's drop down into the bass section here. We're going below 100 hertz here, which, you know, a bass singer in the opera might sing right about there. So dropping below that, we have this series of notes here, which uh, Nicholas and I will explore with the cello. They're, they're called A notes. We have um, uh, B notes, and at the very bottom, well below our limit of hearing, are the C notes. Now, the only other singer here is the fin whale. They have a, a, a simpler song, pro producing um, a series of pulses where they just modulate the frequency of these pulses. And you can see those represented here. So if we were together in the same room, I would have a very special and powerful speaker that would allow you to feel the blue whale song and the fin whale song uh, because it would move a lot of air in the room and the walls would shake. Uh, so tonight we're going to adapt since we're doing this in a virtual format and we're going to raise the, s the pitch or the frequency of these songs. Um, yes. So now we're going to just hear one of those um, phrases from a humpback whale song. So the shortest sound you will hear in a humpback whale song is referred to as a unit. We could consider it a note. Those are arranged into phrases, and phrases are repeated as themes. And a collection of themes is a song. And an individual whale may sing their song for hours to up to a day. And as uh, Roger Payne described long ago, they will even time their surface breathing so that they don't interrupt the rhythm of the song. So now we're going to hear just one phrase from a uh, humpback whale. And now um, let's, let's imagine for a moment, imagine that you weigh 200,000 pounds, yet you feel weightless. And uh, imagine that you can dive into the deep, dark depths of the ocean and lower your heart rate to two beats per minute. Or imagine that you can speak using only your voice, no technology, and you can be heard by someone 100 miles away. 
These are some of the everyday experiences of a blue whale. In fact, we're going to start with blue whale song when we bring in the instrumentation in a moment. So for now, I'm just going to, again, uh, point to the elements of a blue whale song. This indicator for F is the fin whale, so we're temporarily going to ignore that. And we're going to focus on the lowest uh, frequency song units of a blue whale song, C, down near 11 hertz. The third harmonic of the B call, it, its fundamental is down here, still below our limit of hearing, around 14 and a half hertz. And the harmonics, however, uh, we can see five harmonics above that fundamental, rather four above the fundamental. And the strongest one is the third harmonic. That's what we use to study blue whale song because the signal is so strong and clear. So the relationship between this C note and the third harmonic of the B, it's the frequency is, is about four times higher. And then multiply the frequency again by about two, and you're near the top of this A uh, call frequency range. So first we're going to explore the relationship between these notes with the cello. So Nicholas, w if w you would bring that wonderful cello up, we can just hear the individual notes. Now what you see here is um, about 30, 34 minutes, 33 minutes of song, and the A calls are happening with their own cadence at a higher frequency of occurrence. We're seeing the B calls, and before every B fundamental is a C, so it's like a precursor note. So maybe let's start at the lowest end. Now this C call is 11 hertz, but the cello can't do that. However, it can do five times 11, 55. 55 hertz by hand, I tune the cello down. Excellent, 55. 55. And 55. Okay, and, and uh, that's five times higher frequency than the actual sound that would shake this room. Then we go up to the third harmonic of the B call right around, um, in reality, 44 hertz, but we're going to multiply that by 5 again, and we end up with a 220, 220 hertz. Okay, yeah, and then we go to the top of the blue whale scale, which is 88 by 5, 440 hertz. Okay, let's hear each of those one more time, Nicholas, please. 55. Great. Okay. So those are the building blocks, and you can see they, they can arrange these notes in a variety of ways to create song. So let's now go to an actual excerpt from one of the songs recorded by Monterey Canyon, and here's that high um, highest frequency A call. As you can see, it's um, staccato or per percussive or um, pulsed in nature. That occurs in this, uh, the first in this song sequence, followed by a, a rest, then the lowest note, the 55 in our case, and then followed by a two-part B note. Then there's a rest, and then the whale repeats that sequence. So Nicholas has translated this into the cello. Yeah, that's on the level of blue whale improvisation. Wonderfully done. So thank you so much, Nicholas. And uh, now let's turn to, you know, what we can learn by studying blue whale song. I 
actually I'm going to first do a sound check. If I'm playing a clip, is it is it okay to play the clip now? It's okay. Great. Great. Okay, so first we're going to actually speed up that Blue Whale song segment that Nicholas just translated for cello. We're going to play it um, at 10 times its normal speed so that it's easily heard through ordinary speakers. Okay, now, now we're going to turn to the science. i um, just going to highlight one result that was recently published. Uh, the work was led by Will A. Strike, who's a graduate student at Stanford Hopkins Marine Station. And he's been working with Jeremy Goldbogen's lab. And Jeremy and his team put tags on the backs of whales that allow them to observe the uh, undersea world from the perspective of the whale and make important measurements. They just attach to the back with suction cups and, and fall off, and then they go retrieve them and learn uh, what that tag can teach them. So Will and his work is combining this technology that rides on the backs of whales with the hydrophone technology sitting at the bottom of the ocean. And each of these is very complementary. Each one needs the other to really understand uh, blue whales. Um, so we had five years of recordings, continuous recordings, observing blue whales singing year after year. And so Will analyzed uh, that data, and, and that describes how the whole blue whale population is behaving within range of, of what we can hear, the, the animals that are within earshot of our hydrophone. And yet, in order to understand that population level behavior, we really need that individual level perspective. From the hydrophone, we only get song behavior, but from the tags, they can get song behavior, foraging, and migration. So this plot here for the months uh, of the year, starting with May here, winter in the middle, represents the amount of song we're hearing. And if the value is right about one, it means we're not hearing song. So song begins to rise up slightly in July and then sharply reaching a peak in November before declining and again becoming non-detectable here. Now, the, the reason the song disappears from our hydrophone in by about February is not because the blue whales have stopped singing. They're still singing their hearts out uh, in breeding habitat much further south at low latitudes. So um, we always have to keep in mind uh, all these aspects of uh, migration, foraging, and acoustic behavior together to understand the patterns that we see. So let's now look at something that uh, we noticed when we were studying this pattern of, of song. We, what we found is that blue whales don't sing the same amount day and night. When they first begin singing early in the fall, the amount of singing that occurs during the night rises sharply, such that the night to day ratio is above one. So up here at 1.5 would be mean they were singing about 50% more during the night than during the day. And then as the season progresses toward winter, this ratio of night to day drops off and it eventually drops below one such that they're singing more during the day. And we wondered, you know, what would cause this change in singing behavior throughout the year? And what Will found from information collected by the whales is that during the fall, they're very focused on feeding, building up their energy stores for that incredibly long migration. And so during the day while they're feeding, they're not singing and therefore the song is more intense at night. By the time we get into migration, they're singing as much or more during the day and these are very long migrations and the whole time they could be uh, just continuously singing. So we're going to take a brief intermission and right after this return for 
uh, the science of humpback whale song, but first we're going to hear from Mary Alice. Thank you, John and Nick. This year's Whale Fest Monterey will be virtually presented on Facebook Live, YouTube, and AMP. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, January 26th, 27th, 28th, and 29th at 7 p.m. For more information, please see our websites of whalefest.org and montereywharf.com. Won't you please remember to donate any amount. Our virtual whale fest will have the symposium of world-renowned marine experts with fascinating presentations. Dozens of marine-oriented exhibitors will tell about their unique contributions, and our wonderful musicians will entertain you as well. Thank you to our sponsors, Marine Life Studies and Fisherman's Wharf Association. Back to you, John, Nick, and the Beethovens of the Deep. Yeah, they're getting they're getting a number of uh, nicknames this evening. Beethovens of the Deep. I'm going to call them the jazz and opera singers because <laughs> of how they seem to improvise so readily on these complex songs and how they can cover such a tremendous frequency range. So um, turning back to the humpback whales, remembering this is our spectrogram, and each of these can be considered a note. Here we have an, um, an example of a song lasting roughly 15 minutes, a pause, and being repeated. And um, so what we're going to do now is, is answer the question, great, we can hear the song, we can describe when it's happening, but what does that teach us about their lives? So for this, um, we really need to think about how is it that we study the ocean? It's a very complex and difficult to access environment. And yet, whether it's sensors in the ocean or satellites orbiting the Earth, watching the ocean from above, we can learn a lot about the ecosystem that they are living in. And here along the California coast, we're in um, an ecosystem called the California Current Upwelling Ecosystem. And in this ecosystem, particularly during spring and summer and into fall, the prevailing winds are northwesterly. And that forcing of the wind pushing the surface of the ocean combined with the Earth's rotation caused surface waters to move away from the coast. And the result of that is that deep, cold water rises to the surface along the coast. And that Cold water is responsible for not only the invention of the wetsuit, but also the fertilization of the entire ecosystem because those deep cold waters, like a compost pile, are enriched in the nutrients that fertilize the growth of microscopic algae, and from there the food web uh, branches. Ultimately, uh, even the whales rely on that process of photosynthesis. So here we have the sanctuary boundaries again. There's where we're listening. These green diamonds show where uh, Francisco Chavez at Ambari monitors the ecosystem. Uh, this location here shows where uh, Rafael Cudella at UC Santa Cruz monitors a toxin that can uh, enter the food web and affect whales and marine mammals. And these gray dots show where Jared Santora and others monitor krill what the whales actually eat. So we're going to uh, examine all of these elements of the ecosystem and how that relates to the behavior of humpback whales. So let's start with um, the first three years of our recording. And each year, what you're seeing represented by the bar is the total amount of song, that is the percent of the time that we heard them singing. During those three years, the amount of time that we heard them singing more than doubled. This is a really large behavioral signal. 
And so we wonder, well, what could cause such an increase in the amount of song we're hearing in the ocean? And the most obvious and simplest hypothesis is that there was more song because there were more whales. And here's where we worked with uh, Nancy Black at Monterey Whale Watch and uh, Karen Forney at NOAA, who were synthesizing the Whale Watch observations. And so their data can help us answer that first hypothesis. And this is the number of humpback whale sightings per trip in each of these years, corresponding to these the same time periods. What we can see is that it doesn't appear that the number of whales sighted could explain all that strong increase in song. Um, the second hypothesis was that something about the ecosystem changed and influenced the behavior of the whales. So we're going to start at the very beginning. Um, there was a program run out of UC Santa Cruz for a while called Wind to Whales, because in fact, whales depend ultimately on the wind that drives this ocean circulation and fertilizes the ecosystem. So let's look at those upwelling winds, the northwesterly wind strength over those three years, climbing year after year, just like the song occurrence. And this upwelling driven by the winds would enrich the productivity of microscopic algae. And in fact, Francisco Chavez at Ambari measured that. This is the core of the food web what transforms non-living matter into living matter so that whales can eat. And those trends are quite parallel. Now we're going to look at the krill, which is what the whales actually eat. And again, uh, Jared Santora and Noah collected these data. And what we see is this zero line means normal or typical. If it's below zero, it means there are fewer krill, less food available for the whales. If it's greater than zero, there's an abundance of food, more food than usually available for the whales. And what we can see is the same increasing trend over the three years. And the idea here, when we look down at the small level of life in the ocean, is that if you're a whale and you need to gather a lot of energy to support a massive body, it's a lot easier to do when there's a the lot of food resources available. And likely, you would have to spend less time and energy gathering your food and building up your energy stores and therefore perhaps have more time for song behavior. And so these aspects of the ecosystem represent a positive relationship. One supports the other. However, as I mentioned, this monitoring of a toxin called domoic acid, which occurs in certain phytoplankton, microscopic algae around the world, it would cause amnesic shellfish poisoning in humans. And in marine mammals, it can cause, uh, it, it's, a, it's a neurotoxin, it can cause uh, dysfunction and even death. So let's look at the toxin concentrations. And what we see is that they were highest in that first year when we had the most whale sightings and the least song. And they decreased thereafter. Now, being that this is a neurotoxin, it could certainly affect behavior. So the hypothesis there is that more food, less toxic food, would enable more of this healthy behavior of song. So, you know, whales, all animals in the ocean, all life forms in the ocean, they're not independent of their environment and their ecosystem. They're very closely integrated with it. So this is the type of uh, insight that studying humpback whale song can give us. So now we're going to switch over to a recording. And this recording is going to be both, you're going to see the sound and hear the sound. This is just 10 minutes from record recording in the deep ocean uh, at the Mars Observatory. And it's, it's, it's chorusing humpback whales. So you'll hear, hear, hear more than one voice, more than one whale's voice. And Nicholas is going to compose with the great whales.
before uh, we close and we hear from Nicholas and Michael perhaps singing the blues, I just wanted to emphasize that staying with the blues, this scientific discovery was really essentially that we could hear their migration, which is um, valuable not only for understanding their lives, but also perhaps protecting them because we can know when they are moving from Monterey Bay uh, across uh, very dense shipping lanes further south, for example. So we do aim these scientific studies to ultimately help uh, benefit conservation. Thank you, Dr. John Ryan and Nicholas Fettis for guiding us on this wonderful musical voyage. We hope you are inspired by these magnificent creatures and join us for our virtual Whale Fest Monterey, January 26th, 27th, 28th, 29th, 2021 at 7 p.m. at Facebook Live, YouTube, and AMP. And please remember to donate. Please help us, our sponsors, Monterey's Fisherman's Wharf and Marine Life Studies, hosting the most informative, exciting, and successful Whale Fest ever. Remember to please go to whalefest.org and montereywharf.com and hit that donate button. Thank you so much. We truly appreciate you. Happy holidays. And now, Nicholas and Michael Martinez are going to uh, give you a bit of a treat and uh, enjoy them. So you've heard the humpback whales. To me, they're the Beethovens of the whale kingdom since Beethoven's birthday is coming up in a couple weeks. And now we're going to hear blues, the human form of the blues, with my good friend Michael and myself. The Baby Beluga Blues. All right. Hit the bass. Hit the bass. Yeah. <laughs> the human blues. <laughs> Thank you. 
Martinez. Thank you for tuning in. Donate to Whale Fest. Mary Ellen, would you like to oh, talk to our people as we have viewers online? Uh, actually, I um, want to say thank you one more time, and please remember to donate, and see you in January. Thank you so much.